you very much, um, Moritz, for the introduction. Uh, it's great to actually be here. Uh, not so many conferences this year, so this is a great uh, opportunity to present some of the work and give you a review about indirect dark matter searches with uh, Cherenkov telescopes. So I probably don't have to repeat this, uh, that there's overwhelming evidence for the existence of dark matter on all astrophysical scales. Um, you can start here with um, the rotation curves uh, of galaxies, um, uh, where you can see a clear uh, dark matter halo. You also see um, where you have evidence from dark matter dating back to the 1930s. Um, with uh, Fritz Zwicky saying that the uh, escape velocities of, of, uh, of galaxies and galaxy clusters uh, would be too large if there was no additional dark matter content. You have evidence from uh, microlensing, uh, mapping out the uh, mass distributions of galaxy clusters. For example, here you can see this nicely in the uh, bullet cluster where you have two clusters merging. And of course, you have overwhelming evidence uh, for dark matter from fluctuations of the cosmic microwave background. Uh, which gives us sort of the picture today that um, about 30% of the energy <clears throat> content of the universe is made up uh, of dark matter. The question, of course, now is um, if dark matter is an additional fundamental particle uh, beyond the standard model, uh, what could it be? So here in the center, in this little sketch here, you see sort of the content of the standard model, a little bit idealized. And here you see all kinds of different particles uh, that could be... Um, could be a dark matter uh, candidate. Um, this is also kind of illustrated nicely in this little sketch uh, from Tim Tate, where you see many, many uh, models that contain a dark matter candidate. Uh, and we have talked a lot about weakly interacting massive particles uh, throughout this uh, conference so far. Um, so this is largely encapsulating the supersymmetric uh, models here. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and uh, I'll also cover uh, axons and axion-like particles. You hear more about that tomorrow, um, but I would like to tell you a little bit what Cherenkov telescopes can do to constrain um, these particles. Interestingly, um, the masses of these dark matter candidates uh, are largely different. So if you talk about axion-like particles and axions being your dark matter candidate, these usually have masses below a milli electron volt. Um, your weakly interacting massive particles usually um, are considered to have masses between a GeV and maybe TeV. Um, and of course, there, there might be even more massive candidates out here like primordial black holes. Okay, so let's um, talk a little bit about Cherenkov telescopes. Um, so on this slide, you see uh, the three maybe most um, uh, well-known um, Cherenkov telescope experiments. Uh, there are, of course, others out there, which I won't cover today. And I won't, also won't talk about water Cherenkov detectors. Um, but you can see here um, the currently operating or yeah, the subselection of currently operating ones. You have the magic telescopes. We heard about that in Javier's talk already um, uh, based on the Canary Islands. There will be a dedicated talk about dark matter searches by the magic telescopes uh, right after mine. Um, you have the Veritas telescopes on Mount Hopkins in Arizona. Uh, if you followed the US elections, you probably know now where Arizona is, uh, if you didn't know before. And uh, then uh, you have the HESC telescopes, which are situated in Namibia and the Coma Highlands. And they usually instrument gamma rays uh, above 50 GeV or so, uh, up to um, hundreds of TeV, or it's, it's in principle possible. Uh, and the future of Cherenkov telescopes, which I will also talk about today, uh, is uh, almost here. Um, it's the Cherenkov telescope array. It will have two sites also on the Carni uh, Canary Islands and also in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And you see here uh, two artists' impressions of how these arrays will look like. So on the Canary Islands, you see, for example, here the old magic telescopes and then the different size telescopes of the Cherenkov telescope array. Uh, the covered energy range that is foreseen for the Cherenkov telescope array is between 20 GeV and uh, 300 TeV. And the goal is to have a factor of 10 improvement in the point source sensitivity compared to currently operating Cherenkov telescopes plus an improvement in the spectral and uh, spatial resolution. And thanks to the two sites that are foreseen, we uh, can observe the full sky. So for example, in the north, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to observe, for example, the galactic center because you have to go to very high zenith angles, which will give you a high energy threshold. As you can also see from these artists' impressions, um, the, uh, the, the um, array will consist of uh, different sized telescopes, um, in the center, you will have the large size telescopes, which are sort of responsible for the low energy range. 
you have mid-sized telescopes that uh, sort of cover your energy range from 100 GeV to 10 TeV. And then you have the small size telescope spread out over a large um, uh, area uh, that will cover uh, the high energy range. Uh, let's have a quick look at uh, the uh, sensitivity of these instruments. So what you can see here as a function of energy is uh, the flux that is required from a point source to get a five sigma detection of the source within a 50 hour observation time. Um, so you can see here, uh, they are currently operating telescopes like MAGIC and Hess and Veritas. MAGIC extending a little bit to lower energies here. Uh, and then you can see here what is foreseen for CTA. So the Northern Array will have a little bit less sensitivity um, at the high energies because it has, or it's foreseen to have fewer mid-sized uh, telescopes and uh, no small size telescopes. So that's why you get the uh, higher sensitivity for the Southern Array here. So which targets um, do we usually look at with Cherenkov telescopes when we are looking for uh, annihilating dark matter signals? So I will focus first on annihilating dark matter signals. Uh, I will not talk about decay or so, and then later I'll come back to axions. Um, so you've seen in Francesca's talk, a version of uh, this equation before, uh, where, where this is the uh, predicted gamma ray flux from a, from a dark matter annihilation. This is the particle physics part here where you have the different branching ratios and the gamma ray spectrum for each uh, of the branching ratios or each of the uh, annihilation channels. Uh, you have the um, annihilation cross-section here, the dark matter mass, uh, then a factor uh, that um, yeah, differs whether your dark matter is self-annihilating or not. Uh, and then you have an astrophysical J factor, which we also um, already talked about, which is essentially the dark matter density squared integrated over the line of sight and um, your uh, solid angle that you're looking at. And um, we've also seen versions of this plot before, where you see sort of the J factor predicted from, um, from simulations, where in the center here, you have the galactic center, you have many uh, satellites here uh, that Javier covered in his talk. And also you could have, uh, for example, here, galaxy clusters that are also predicted to have a high dark matter content. Uh, and these are of course all covered in um, posters uh, and talks throughout this conference. So what I will focus on is the uh, galactic center, which is a, uh, or maybe the prime target for searches uh, with IACTs, um, since it has the largest predicted J factor. But as we already heard, this comes with large uncertainties, especially how cuspy or how, how cord uh, this, this um, dark matter distribution is in the center of the Milky Way. The thing is that, yeah, as, as Javier also already said, that we uh, don't monitor the full sky as the Fermi lab does. So we really have to do pointed observations. So we have to decide uh, which target to look at. And of course, then the galactic center with its high J factor and also with interest from the um, yeah, other parts of the, of the high energy gamma ray community is um, probably the preferred target. But of course, there's a lot of astrophysical gamma ray emission present in the galactic center. So this has to be modeled or somehow taken into account. And also the large spatial extent of the galactic center on the sky makes it a little bit more challenging to uh, make an estimate of the residual cosmic ray contamination uh, that we always have to deal with when um, uh, doing trank of telescope ray uh, or yeah, uh, IACT observations. So let's first uh, look a little bit in the past how the uh, HESS telescopes have done this. Um, so in order to get rid of most of the um, astrophysical gamma ray emission, uh, in their analysis or their search for dark matter, they simply excluded a band um, with a width of 0.6 degrees around, um, yeah, centered on the galactic plane. So with this mask, they get rid of most of the uh, astrophysical emission. However, they also get rid of um, the highest dark matter signal, which you would expect to line up more or less with the center. They also included another mask here for this uh, supernova remnant. You see here the moon for size comparison. So you just so just for you to understand how big of a region this is on the sky. And then they looked for dark matter signal in Anguli around the galactic center, uh, and they estimated how much misidentified cosmic rays they have in these Anguli by using this reflected region here, where you also where they also uh, fitted Anguli uh, or used Anguli to then um, get a handle on, on on this cosmic ray background. With this um, analysis procedure, it's immediately clear that um, you can only use uh, this when you have a very cuspy dark matter profile, because once it becomes very cord or more cord, then you get more and more dark matter contribution also to this 
off region here. Um, and then you would basically uh, overestimate the, the background. So they used 250 hours of data uh, with this kind of observation strategy and then used a standard Poisson likelihood to calculate the, uh, the significance of a dark matter signal. Uh, they found none, so they uh, used the same methodology to derive constraints on the annihilation cross-section. Uh, however, um, I would like to note that they didn't include any systematic uncertainties, um, for example, connect to the instrumental response function uh, in their likelihood analysis. And this will uh, become of interest later. Um, and so these are the limits that they derived for um, annihilation into uh, W vector bosons or BV bar. Um, uh, just, yeah, uh, you see that you, uh, they're still, uh, they're effective a few away from the thermal uh, relic cross section, um, but these are very constraining limits already. So what will CTA be able to do or what is planned to be done? Um, so first of all, it is planned that CTA will conduct a survey of the uh, inner galaxy um, consisting of more than 500 hours spread out over the first 10 years of observations. And the pointing positions where the telescopes will look uh, are depicted here in red. So these are galactic coordinates. So these are really nine pointings centered on uh, the galactic center. And the color code is the exposure that is foreseen. Exposure is essentially just the observation time multiplied with the effective area of the telescope. Additionally, an extended survey is planned that will cover higher latitudes uh, here seen in with these blue crosses. Additional 300 hours are planned for this, um, but the sensitivity I'll show you just focuses on these 500 hours on the central galaxy. What uh, we did in our sensitivity study for CTA was not to simply exclude um, uh, the, uh, yeah, this, the galactic disk essentially, uh, we did. We, we tried something uh, more sophisticated, namely a 3D template analysis, 3D meaning the two spatial dimensions on the sky and the energy dimension. We masked a few sources uh, seen here, but otherwise all the uh, other um, possible contributions we tried to model with the template. So for example, here you see the residual cosmic ray contamination, the color code are the photon, predicted photon counts. Also, uh, sub-threshold sources might play a role. So sources that haven't been significantly detected yet, but which might be uh, in, in your field of view or uh, within the, the in a galaxy. Then you have templates for um, the diffuse emission um, that you expect from the inner galaxy, two different models here. Also a template for the Fermi bubbles, which is important to include because they, this template looks kind of similar to what you would expect from a dark matter signal here for a cord inostal, uh, sorry, cuspy inostal profile, and here how the dark matter template would look for a more cord profile. You can then sum over the, uh, uh, the spatial dimensions and look at the predicted spectra. Um, so the predicted number of counts here, and you immediately see that it's extremely important to have a handle on all these different templates, because for example, the cosmic ray um, contribution is four orders of magnitude higher than what you would expect from um, dark matter annihilating into W plus W minus for uh, assuming a 2 TV mass and thermal cross section. So it's really important that you include all these components in your analysis. And that's what we did in a sensitivity study, um, essentially performing simulated or simulations of observations uh, and then doing again a full likelihood analysis but also accounting for systematic uncertainties. Um, so basically saying, okay, we haven't quite understood our instrumental response function. And we, we try to con um, quantify this and include it in the analysis. And this is what you get. So these black lines are now um, the predicted sensitivity for this full galactic center survey. And you see here in uh, purple uh, are the um, limits that uh, you saw from Hess for again, W plus W minus. And you see an improvement of around uh, an order of magnitude. So we really, we, uh, we will be able to probe um, the thermal relic cross section between 200 GeV and maybe 20 TV or so uh, for this annihilation channel. And similarly for the BB bar, um, we will be able to probe sort of this part here of the thermal relic cross section. So I think this is really promising. And I would like to point out one more thing, namely that um, the, uh, the, uh, these, these constraints will be complementary to um, to other searches, uh, th these are this is a plot from three years ago, so the limits might have changed a little bit. But what you can do is, you can essentially convert your limits on the annihilation cross section into a scale uh, of, for example, an effective field theory. So uh, 
sort of a, an easy theory to describe dark matter interactions. So you can combine limits from direct detection, indirect detection, and collider searches. And what you can see here are limits um, for different models, dark matter models, so scalar, pseudo-scalar, vector, and axial vector models. The gray band shows you where you would expect the, the thermal red light density uh, to be. And then in green, so everything below these lines is excluded. So this is direct detection here. So everything below here is excluded. In purple, everything here is excluded. This is what CTA would do. So if you look, for example, at the pseudoscalar models, here the, end, um, the, the direct detection is strongly suppressed due to the um, velocity dependence um, of your dark matter um, theory. And here, really, CTA could, could play a huge role in constraining or looking for dark, these uh, kind of dark matter models. Uh, and um, the, uh, this conclusion essentially hold, also holds for, for simplified models that we discussed a little bit on Monday. OK, now I would like to switch gears a little bit. Oops, that, that was too fast. Um, and I talk about axons and axon like particles. Um, so how would you detect these kind of particles? One way would be to look for an oscillation of axons or axon-like particles into photons in the presence of a magnetic field. So one way you could do this, for example, is you take a light source, immerse it in a magnetic field, then some of the photons would convert into axon-like particles. You could put some light type barrier here. And then on the other side of this light type barrier, you would again put a magnetic field and then look for the reconverted photons. Um, this is essentially what is done in the ALPS2 experiment. There's a talk on this tomorrow. Uh, and also there's a poster uh, describing the, the detection technique a little bit more in detail. What I will be focusing on here is sort of an indirect detection through a disappearance uh, and essentially the energy dependent nature of this disappearance. So how do we do that? Um, essentially, you take a very strong gamma ray emitter for which we have lots of statistics. Uh, which is then also immersed in a strong magnetic field, strong in terms of astrophysical environments. So one prime target is so-called NGC 1275. You see an image here from the Hubble telescope and the China telescope um, here. And it's an active galactic nucleus that is situated at the center of the Perseus cluster. And we believe that the magnetic field inside this Perseus galaxy cluster is uh, pretty strong of the order of 20 microgauss. And what can then happen is that in the magnetic field of this cluster, some photons oscillate into axon-like particles. And we quantify this with the so-called photon survivor probability. So what's the probability that you have in your initial state uh, a photon, and then in your final state, you have a photon as well. And for a particular choice of um, the axon-like particle mass and coupling, this is what you would expect. So you see that you have oscillations in energy here that depend on the actual uh, morphology of your uh, magnetic field. Since we don't know the magnetic field of the Perseus cluster very well, uh, we have to model many um, different realizations of this magnetic field. We believe it is turbulent by nature. Um, so this is these thin lines here you show you kind of the spread that you would expect. Then um, I should mention that it could also be that there's a large coherent component in this cluster, which was uh, discussed in one of the end this paper here. Um, so we clearly need better information on uh, the magnetic fields in these in these galaxy clusters, which will hope which will hopefully become available uh, once once SKA uh, comes online. So essentially, you look for these kind of uh, spectral features uh, on uh, top of the gamma ray spectrum of the source, which we would expect naively to be just a smooth function in energy. You also have to uh, account for a possible reconversion of axon like particles in the magnetic field of the Milky Way. And here's just the uh, conversion probability uh, from axon like particles back to, to photons uh, in, in the Milky Way. OK, so we, we did this kind of analysis with the Fermi lab, but we also did a sensitivity study uh, for CTA. Um, and uh, NGC 1275 will be observed with CTA for more than 300 hours in the first 10 years. Um, because CTA will basically conduct uh, um, uh, deep observations of the Perseus cluster, and NGC 1275 is, is obviously part of that. So what we assumed here is that we would catch this source in, a, in an enhanced activity state, a so-called gamma ray flare, uh, and we would observe the source in such an activity state for 10 hours, which is not unreasonable be, uh, since MAGIC has, done, um, has essentially observed the spectrum for a little bit less uh, time, but has seen this kind of spectrum, so we would kind of believe that uh, maybe we are lucky and, and catch such a gamma ray flare in the future. 
So you see the spectrum here, energy versus the photon flux. The simulation does not include any X amount particles. And then this dashed line you see here is just a fit with a smooth function. And you see the residuals down here. And in orange, you see now a fit including X amount particles with these parameters for the mass and the coupling and a particular a realization of the magnetic field just for illustrative purposes. And you see that there uh, are these oscillations present here. And if you then look at the residuals, they're much larger. So you would be able with simply, a, a, again, a likelihood analysis to rule out uh, these parameters with this particular realization of the magnetic field. So we've done this full likelihood analysis and also included systematic uncertainties. Essentially, um, we also included the possibility that we uh, mismodeled our energy resolution, that the real energy resolution is, is worse than what we expect from, from simulations of the array. So let's take a look at the uh, excellent particle parameter space. Um, you see the coupling here, you see the, the mass here, um, you see exclusions from cosmological arguments here, uh, laboratory exclusions are here, uh, exclusions from essentially uh, pointing a, a magnet at the sun is here. I can talk more about that if you have questions and constraints from stellar lifetimes are over here. In this band, you would expect uh, the QCD axion, uh, which is another very well motivated uh, dark matter candidate that also um, solves the so-called strong CP problem in QCD, uh, dedicated dark matter searches uh, for these kind of particles. And um, so the high energy gamma rays are mostly um, sensitive uh, to axonite particles in this part of the parameter space. So let's zoom in a little bit. Uh, and you see here, um, the result of a Fermi observation uh, in, uh, yeah, thank you, Moritz. Uh, Fermi observation of NGC 1275. And here's what we would expect with this 10 hour observations uh, with CTA, also including these systematic uncertainties I was talking about. And you can see that we're kind of starting, or we hope to start to scratch on this line uh, below which all of the dark matter could be made up uh, from axonite particles. And again, this is only a 10 hour observation of one source. Um, and uh, I mean, there are more sources out there that could be of, of, of interest for, for these kind of searches. Um, so we hope that we could enlarge this parameter space even more. Okay, um, and here's just a slide where I tried a little bit to summarize um, how this technique has been used for other sources. So for example, back in 2013, has did a uh, similar analysis looking for these spectra uh, irregularities using uh, PKS 2155. Uh, these are these green exclusions here. Uh, PKS 2155 is, is also an active galactic nucleus that is within a galaxy group. However, there we are less, much less certain about the actual magnetic field of this galaxy group. And then people have taken the same source and did a Fermi analysis resulting in these green and red uh, exclusions depending on the magnetic field you assume. Um, then there was uh, an interesting study um, this year and also two years ago where they actually found a preference for um, oscillations uh, in the spectra of pulsars. So they only accounted for uh, a mixing uh, of exonite particles in the galactic magnetic field, the magnetic field of the Milky Way, that they found a best fit position here. Uh, these are their updated limits for NGC 1275. Um, but these, um, uh, yeah, this best fit position is sort of in tension with, with other limits. And I would say, um, the statistical approach is still a little bit under debate. Um, so we have, one, we have to see where, where this goes. Um, then people have looked at spectra of supernova remnants, again, uh, looking for oscillations in the magnetic field of the Milky Way, uh, derive these constraints here. Here's again the best fit position of these, these uh, pulsar spectra. Uh, and then uh, this year, there was another update on, on the NGC 1275 analysis, this time uh, using, I think, 12 years of data. Uh, and this dash line is there updated them that I think they use a little bit of a different statistical technique here. Technique here. And I would just like to highlight there will be another talk uh, on essentially the same source in a very similar analysis uh, you, using the magic data I was mentioning earlier. Okay, so uh, I'm running a little bit out of time. Um, I just wanted to mention quickly that you can also look for uh, axon like particles using supernova explosions. Um, so essentially, axonic particles could be produced uh, in a supernova kind of explosion. Um, they could escape the supernova remnant and then reconvert into gamma rays in the uh, magnetic field of the Milky Way. Um, this would be really a smoking gun signal because you wouldn't expect gamma rays at such energies, uh, sort of 60 MeV and above, uh, from a supernova explosion that arrives simultaneously with the neutrinos that are produced in a core collapse supernova. 
Uh, and this is sort of the light curve that you can see here um, as a function of time. So really just tens of seconds long uh, burst of gamma rays. That's what you would expect. Unfortunately, we haven't seen any um, uh, core collapse supernovae recently in our galaxy. Uh, so just this, this year, we were able to put out the first limits using Fermi observations uh, of extragalactic supernovae, where it's much harder to um, estimate the explosion time because we don't have a neutrino detection. Um, yeah, feel free to ask me uh, uh, about more details uh, afterwards. Okay, so uh, with this, I would like to conclude. Um, so I hope I convinced you that Trink of telescopes uh, provide a very nice tool to look for um, dark matter in the form of uh, weakly, uh, weakly interacting mass particles or uh, axon-like particles. And really CTA will be a very important instrument um, that will uh, continue the search. Uh, and just one more slide. So uh, I got a nice grant uh, this year and I will start my own research group um, looking for axions and axon-like particle dark matter with laboratory experiments and astrophysical searches. Uh, so I'll be hiring next year, beginning next year. Uh, the idea is to start this group in June, 2021. So if you have interested students, uh, please let them know, forward them to me. Um, yeah, I will be looking for people. Okay. Thank you.